Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Link at the Integrated Medicine Clinic. I'm glad that everybody could join us tonight. We're going to do a discussion on uh, nutrition and ex exercise, particularly uh, a research update that'll, that will bring it uh, to anyone, even if you didn't take high school biology or chemistry, I don't remember much of it. Uh, we're going to bring it um, to a point that everybody can understand it and really make it useful in their lives. I'd love to read about um, the science of medicine, and particularly the science of integrated medicine, where we can really use nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress reduction to improve the overall outcomes in, in medicine, where we also use good uh, screening techniques, uh, labs, and uh, um, care of things like cholesterol and bone health and hypertension and diabetes, and bring it all together to really have the best outcomes for, for patients. So tonight, um, there'll be uh, opportunities to ask questions. You can do that along the way. You can put that in the questions box below. And Stephanie Link, who's helping me here tonight, will uh, let me know about those questions and we'll try to answer those along the way. At the end, we'll also have some time for question and answers. So again, uh, welcome to everyone. And we are gonna get started. I'm gonna start with a couple of real important slides. This is a, a study that was published just a few weeks ago in March, 2023, and it looked at the Mediterranean diet and its amazing benefit on, on brain health. A 23% reduction in the development of dementia in people who followed the Mediterranean diet. And though we call it that, it really means they're eating whole foods, real, real meats and vegetables and whole grains and fruits and dairy and fish and minimal amounts of alcohol and limited sweets. If they do that, the more they do that, if they have a high adherence to that, they can reduce the risk of dementia in this large study that was just published by 23%. That really got my attention. And over the last couple of years, there's been dozens of studies that have informed me about the proper, the best nutrition for, for brain health, uh, a better, better functioning body, and also how exercise impacts that as well. And this is one of those studies. This was in the um, American Journal of Cardiology in August last year. And here they looked at an enormous amount of veterans, US veterans between the age of 30 and 95. And they found the fitter they were, the better. And the way they an analyzed this is they did a treadmill test on them. And then they followed them over the next several years. And they, they found that even if they were moderately fit, that they had a 50% reduction in, and premature mortality. And what we're gonna learn is that you can get fit doing lots of different things. It's not like you need to go out and run necessarily or ride a bike vigorously. There's all sorts of activities that'll get you good and fit. And they went on to say in this cardiology journal is that fitness was more important than any of the other traditional cardiac risk factors like diabetes or bl blood sugar or blood pressure or blood cholesterol. That's how important fitness is. This study looked at strength training. And what in, this was in the British Journal of Sports Medicine in February of 2022. And they found that folks that did strength training for 30 to 60 minutes a week, so not very much, they could have up to a 17% reduction in heart disease and cancer. They also found in this study, if you combine the strength training with the aerobic training as well, that we they had the steepest or the, the biggest reduction in heart disease and cancer. And it's interesting that we're gonna see throughout the way that um, that fitness makes a difference in many factors that impact our health, uh, in particular, two very important ones, heart disease, blood vessel disease, and cancer. So we wanna get stronger. And this is the last study I'm gonna start with, and then we'll go into some other basics here. This was published just last year in April, and it looked at the combination of three things, taking a vitamin D capsule every day, an omega-3 fish oil capsule every day, and doing a simple home exercise program. And they found that in this study, that each one of those made a difference in, in overall health. They all had a small benefit, but when they were all done together, the vitamin D, the omega-3, and the exercise program, that there was a 61% decreased risk of cancer over the study period really significant. So I'm gonna sum up real quickly here, even before we get into the, 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 the meat of the talk, what 
the important concepts are and the things we've really learned in nutrition over the last couple of decades, and particularly the last few years. We want to eat more whole foods, real meats, real vegetables, real berries, real nuts, terrific oils, olive oil uh, is uh, amazing. We want to eat less processed foods and, and do our best not to eat too much. We know that many different diets can be exceptionally healthy from the vegetarian diet on one side, all the way to the, the paleo diet on the other side, the Mediterranean diet in the middle. If you're eating whole foods that are, those are particularly healthy dietary programs or um, patterns. The diet that's not healthy is the standard American diet. And we'll take a few minutes as we go on here to look at why that is. And then again, as we start, I'm gonna sum up some of the most important information about exercise, and then we'll put in the, the details on why, why this is the case. It's important to move, get steps and move in many different ways. All sorts of exercises can be helpful. And that can be walking, it could be playing racket sports like pickleball, like so many people like to play these days. Um, it could be riding an exercise bike, it could be gardening. You wanna move throughout the day. The second thing is you want to focus on getting stronger, and we'll look at some particular exercises, but really simple, basic exercises, a home program that might include things like squats and planks and lunges can be very, very beneficial, and maybe some bands or some light weights, and you want to get your heart rate up a few days a week, and it really doesn't need to be for a prolonged period of time. So what are we trying to prevent? This is a slide that talks about the reasons we die. And, and this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand those, understand the risk factors for it, and understand the important things we can do to, to push off mortality longer and to increase the, our, our health span, how long we live vigorously um, longer so we can live healthier into our later decades of life. Heart disease is the number one killer. That's a blood vessel disease related to atherosclerosis. Cancer is the number two killer in the US. Respiratory disease is number three. And then strokes are number four. And that again is related to atherosclerosis, a blood vessel disease, hypertension, et cetera. Injuries are number five. And number six now in the US and around the world, Alzheimer's disease. So this is these are some of the most important things. So we do wanna take better care of our brain and our body, and there is immense benefit of the proper nutrition, and we don't have to be perfect, just really aim in the directions of eating real food and limiting processed foods and exercise. Well, this is a question for you. So just based on some of the things we've already talked about and what you know about, you think if, if you're gonna enjoy coffee, and I'll tell you right up front that coffee is found to be a terrific source of antioxidants and very safe, two to three cups a day, and generally helps many different conditions from, from mood to liver disease to even, even heart health. There's, there's benefits, interestingly. But if you're gonna have coffee in the morning, what should you put in it? Should you put a, a, a low-fat creamer or should you put whole cream? And over the next few slides, we'll help give more information to answer that question. You can think about it along the way. A second question here. So further into that area, if is there good data now, nutritional science, that tells us that we should limit saturated fats because they're a significant cause of heart disease? Well, very surprisingly, the most recent data, and I'm going to show you three papers over the last three years, that strongly tells us it is not a major cause of cardiovascular disease. The first paper was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. So this is the most esteemed journal of cardiology in the US in August of 2020. And they reported right up front that, that dietary guidelines as of August 20 said that saturated fat should be limited to less than 10%. But in their review of the research for the last 10 years, they said that several foods that are rich in saturated fats, like whole fat dairy, dark chocolate, unprocessed meat, are not associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease or diabetes. Amazing. And they went on to say in this position statement, in this important journal of cardiology, that there is no robust evidence that limiting saturated fat consumption will prevent cardiovascular disease or reduce mortality. Wow, that's striking. What about dairy? This is 
September 2021, and this was a really interesting study. It was in done in it was done in Sweden. It followed 4,150 people, 60 years and older, and now we can actually measure in the blood of these individuals a particular biomarker, a particular fat that gives us direct indication about how much dairy they have been consuming in their diet. So this isn't based on just a questionnaire by asking them, you know, how much cream or milk or yogurt do they have? This is actually measuring how much they have. And they found that the, the individuals with the highest level of this dairy fat biomarker, this carbon-15 biomarker, uh, had the lowest levels of cardiovascular disease. The highest amounts of dairy fat consumption, as indicated by the blood biomarker, showed the lowest risk for cardiovascular disease. That was stunning, but it was very consistent now with the data we found from the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, the previous study. Now, this last year in the European Journal of Preventive Cardiology, another important journal, they looked at the literature for the last 11 years as to whether saturated fat consumption was associated significantly with cardiovascular disease. And they said that saturated fat is, is not a villain, um, that the consumption of saturated fat is not significantly associated with cardiovascular events or mortality. It's not saying that we should just eat dairy fat or dairy products all day long, but it's saying that whole food, whole fat dairy, it can be part of a, of a healthy dietary pattern for sure. Okay, so we're back to the question. Should it be the coffee mate or the heavy cream? And I think the answer is it's the heavy cream because it's a whole food, but more importantly, because of the ingredients here in the coffee mate, oh my goodness, there is several different sugars in here. There's hydrogenated oils. There's all sorts of things that are not good for the for human health. Corn syrup, solids, hydrogenated vegetable oil, um, colorings, diglycerides. I mean, these uh, palm kernel and other oil, soybean oil. This is not a healthy whole food, and it's got a lot of things in it that you don't necessarily want to be putting in your body on a daily basis. So the ingredients of organic whole cream is indeed organic whole cream. So this would be my recommendation if you enjoy it. Now, some people like their coffee black, and that's okay too. So leading from this last slide, it's important for us to read labels, because if we look at the front of this package, we see that this breakfast cereal is heart healthy and lowers cholesterol, so it must be good for us. But it's important to read the labels on the front and the back. And when you look here, it indeed does have whole grain oats in it, and that's a whole food. We'll talk more about what it means to grind that whole grain open, oat into powder, which is so digestible and can raise our blood sugar in, further in a minute. But the other ingredients in here, sugar is number two, cornstarch, which is another starchy sugary molecule is number three. Number four is honey. Number five is brown sugar syrup. Not a good product for your heart, particularly if you're wanting to keep your triglycerides low because triglycerides are elevated by, by, by starches and by sugar. And if you want to reduce the risk of diabetes, so not a really healthy product. Let's briefly take a look at carbohydrates. So these are all carbohydrates. That's one of the three macronutrients. And there certainly can be a part of a healthy diet. But when you look on the left, it's a lot of processed carbohydrates from the Coca-Cola to, to even the orange juice, the pasta and the bagels. So those carbohydrates are very processed and they drive and they increase our blood sugar rapidly that has all sorts of detr detrimental effects in the human body. Whereas the carbohydrates on the right, those whole grain oats in the whole form, they're not ground into a powder. The sweet potatoes, the kale, and those wonderful uh, lentils. So those are terrific carbohydrates to be eating. They're high in fiber, high in nutrition, and they're, they're digested slowly in the human digestive tract, and they release their nutrients and their starch in a slow way such that it doesn't drive and bounce the blood sugar high. Along these lines, this paper was published just a few weeks ago in the British Medical Journal, and it looked at dietary sugar consumption very large study. And they said that dietary sugar consumption has many harmful associations 
It increases body mass index in children and adults, increases diabetes, coronary heart disease, LDL cholesterol, hypertension, stroke, neurodegenerative conditions. Those are things like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, autoimmune diseases, fatty liver. We'll talk about that more in, in a few minutes and seven different cancers. So in this study published within the last month, they said that they recommend that we reduce the consumption of, of added sugars to less than 25 grams a day total. And then we limit the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages to less than one serving weekly. Wow, that's much different than we may have thought. And just for an example, one teaspoon of sugar has about four grams of sugar. A 12 ounce soda has 39 grams of sugar or about 10 teaspoons. A cup of Frosted Flakes has about 15 grams, just one cup, 15 grams of sugar or four teaspoons. When we look at sh sugar intake, the liquid calories are particularly harmful. They lead to weight gain, diabetes, heart disease, dementia, and aging, they're the worst. And a person who might have several different sugar sweetened beverages or, or even the orange juice, which is um, a very high glycemic drink. It has 110 calories primarily from fruit sugar, um, both glucose and fructose, very rapidly. All of these are very rapidly absorbed through our digestive tract and increase our blood sugar. And you can have, you know, about 1400 calories if you were to have the orange juice in the morning, a sweet coffee on the way to work, maybe a, uh, a cola at lunch, um, some things to drink after um, work when you're cutting the grass and then maybe a beer with the ball game. I mean, this, this would be almost all of your calories uh, for a day in this one, not, not a healthy way to feed yourself. Because it leads to things like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I would suspect that some folks in the audience know about this already. We now know that about a third of the US population have the, has this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or a hundred million people that it is the most common cause of liver failure and transplant in 2023 in the US. And in, even in children, it has doubled in the last 20 years. So I'm gonna ask you another question here. Do you think with this fatty liver disease that it's better to eat a low fat diet or a low carb diet? And it seems obvious to most people that it'd be low fat because it's the fat that is, is is being um, stored abnormally in the liver, causing the inflammation of the liver, but it's in fact a low carb diet. And the reason that is, is that when we eat too many starches or drink too many uh, sugar containing or added sugar containing drinks or even fruit juices, that that excess sugar is taken to the liver. And what the liver does is it biotransforms. It takes the sugar and it puts into a triglyceride, which is a fat, it stores it in the liver and it sends it out to the body to be stored in body tissues. So the body changes sugar very rapidly, but particularly when blood sugar is high after we eat or drink something like that. And it changes in our liver and causes inflammation in our liver, which is a big problem in the US. The study looked at it really carefully and it was in January of 2023 in a, the Journal of Internal Medicine. And what they found or what they compared was two different diets, a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, where almost 60% of the calories were from fat, or a high carbohydrate, low fat diet, where less than 30% of the calories were, were from fat. And they found that there were significant improvements in the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the low carb, high fat diet. And even the type two diabetes in, in some of these patients were better with the low carb, high fat diet. The author went on to say, basically, if you have fat in your liver, you will benefit from eating more of your dietary calories from fat. Now, if a person is well overfed, whether it be from carbohydrates and starches or from fat, you can get fatty liver. But with a standard diet, you're better off not eating the high carbs if you have a fatty liver condition or a metabolic condition like diabetes. This is a reference book for people. It's a, it's a relatively recent book. It's called The Glucose Revolution uh, by this author here, Jesse Inshoff. And, and it is very well-written and easily understood about these concepts 
the ways that we can feed ourselves that will reduce the risk of things like diabetes and high triglycerides and fatty liver disease. And it's how, you know, how you can choose the right foods, but also the timing of the foods that can make a difference as well. So a summary of foods to eat, lots of veggies, lots of colorful veggies, beans, lentils, and whole grains, and grains in the whole form, like a steel cut oat, for example, fruits of all kinds. But if you're a diabetic, you're better off eating less fruits because of the fruit sugar. Meats, poultry, fish and eggs for sure. Whole dairy and cheese is fine. Nuts of all kinds and, and oils, and uh, particularly olive oil and sweet, sure, but not very many. And lots of uh, love and joy with your food is helpful too. Another question for, for everybody to think about. What percentage of, of the calories in the American diet come from ultra-processed foods? Is it as much as 20%, 30%, or could it be as much as 50% of the, of the population in the, of the calories in the U.S. population? Well, as of this year, it's greater than 50%. And that's just, it's um, what's making many uh, individuals in the U.S. less healthy than they could be. It doesn't mean you should never have these sorts of foods, but just less of them. The study was in January of this year. So almost all of these studies I'm showing you are within the last year. Some are a little bit further back, just as a, um, as a reference point, but so many of these. And so now we know in both the UK and the U US that the calories from ultra processed foods are greater than 50%. That studies have shown previously that these foods increase the risk of obesity, type two diabetes, autoimmune diseases of many different kinds and dying prematurely, that's all cause mortality. And this study looked at almost 200,000 people, followed them for 10 years. And they found that people that had a, a diet that was high in these ultra processed foods, that they had an increase of 34 different site specific cancers over that time period. So summary here is that we know that these ultra processed foods increase things like obesity, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. They increase autoimmune diseases like inflammation uh, throughout the body, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, others. They increase heart disease, which is ASCVD. They increase neurodegenerative diseases like dementia, and now we know cancer as well. Again, it doesn't mean you should never have these. It's just less of them. Fill yourself up with the good foods and have less of these. Now, I briefly showed you this study in the, in the very beginning uh, in the British uh, BMC Medicine Journal in 2023, March. And they showed the more you stuck to these, this, this Mediterranean type diet, and it's really the foods, the nuts, the oils, the whole grains, the dairy, modest, modest amounts of alcohol, and limited sweets, the better the person did in regards to the brain health going forward. This was studied, excuse me, this study was published the same month, March of 2023. And it also looked at this healthy dietary pattern, this Mediterranean diet pattern and, and brain health. And this was a study done through Rush University in Chicago, where they followed patients for multiple years, three to 11 years until they died. These were older adults and they had evidence about their brain health and their dietary patterns. And then they underwent an autopsy and, and they found that folks that had the highest intake of this dietary pattern uh, had the lowest amount of Alzheimer's disease pathology, which is amyloid and tau and other proteins that, um, that aggregate in the brain in a, in a negative fashion that can change a person's ability to th think and function well. Big standouts for this food pattern were berries, greens, and olive oil. They made a difference, and we see this in many different studies. This is a study that looked particularly at olive oil. And excuse me, I'm going to take a drink here. <clears throat> In the, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, again, that very important cardiology journal. And they looked at folks that had a half a tablespoon of olive oil daily. 
And they had lower heart disease, lower cancer, and lower dementia by 15 to 25%. Olive oil is known to be anti-inflammatory. It feeds the gut microbiome and keeps us with a healthier, more diverse GI microbiome. It improves the function of the lining of the blood vessels. It improves the, the lipid profiles. It, it improves um, insulin sensitivity and glucose control, and it lowers blood pressure. It has lots of benefits in human health. This is another study where it looked at, well, can it be any kind of olive oil or does it need to be extra virgin olive oil? And here they clearly said that the extra virgin olive oil made a difference and that the common olive oil, which would be a second pressing or a pressing that, um, or a way that the olive oil is obtained through chemical methods, that it's not nearly as good for us and that we only saw reductions in, uh, in excess mortality in the extra virgin olive oil and in heart disease. So the key with olive oil is the more the better. Here in this study, they were using one and a half tablespoons per day. And in other studies, major studies in olive oil, they would use three to four tablespoons a day. And all of those were found to be healthy. Now on the right, you can see a picture of an olive tree. You know that olive trees are known to live hundreds, if not thousands of years. There's olive trees uh, on the island of Crete that are at least 2000 years old. So they, they were on the earth when these uh, important historical figures like Julius Caesar or Cleopatra were on the earth, pretty amazing. So olive oil, get the real stuff is important. Just, just a, a quick primer, a um, little bit more on olive oil. It's high in the polyphenols and it's those green components that give you it's the peppery, spicy nature are particularly healthy. And in the common olive oil, they're all almost always extracted out. The common olive oils are almost, they're often called light olive oils. They don't have a lot of taste or flavor. Extra virgin olive oil is great to cook with. It has a smoke point over 400, so you can cook almost anything in it. And it's certainly done that way in Europe, even though we have this kind of common knowledge in the US that you can't cook with olive oil, that's not true. The polyphenols in the olive oil give it a higher smoke point, make it have more of an antioxidant um, capacity so it can tolerate the heat. The other thing to know about olive oil is, is it's not like wine. It's not better with age and it should be used in a couple of years and stored in a dark, cool place. We're getting done with the, the nutrition part of this talk here. I want to talk about uh, what I think is a forgotten uh, macronutrient. There's three macronutrients. There's the carbohydrates, the fats, and the protein. The carbs and the fats get all the attention. But these days, uh, more and more, we know that protein is exceptionally important and maybe the most important macronutrient. In fact, even the name uh, came from the Greek word proteus, Proteios, possibly, and, um, and it means that it's primary. You're very, very important. The current RDA has been found with recent research that is the recommended daily allowance of about a uh, half a gram per pound is way too low. And it was really designed to keep a sedentary adult alive and not, not a healthy, active adult, allow them to thrive. Uh, we also know that muscle is, excuse me, that Protein is really important to keep us from losing muscle as we age. Many adults lose their, their, their muscle mass in their shoulders and their hips and their thighs, and they're not able to be as functional. Squat, lift things, walk up hills, these kind of things, uh, get up and down easily. So these days we think more like 0.7 grams per pound. So a 150 pound adult would need about 100 grams of protein a day. And that's if you wanna be active and you wanna maintain your weight. But if you want to build muscle, it's actually more than that. It's about a gram per pound per day is the new recommendation. So much more than we were taught. And this level of protein intake has no detrimental effect on the liver or the kidneys. So more proteins better. 30 to 40 grams of protein uh, with three meals a day. And this gives you an idea that an egg has about seven grams of protein. So if you're gonna get a lot of your protein from your breakfast meal, you might need several eggs or other sources. A uh, four ounce piece of salmon is gonna have about 30 grams. A four ounce piece of beef will have about 30 grams. There's some other examples here. Um, a couple cups of beans will have about 30 grams. This is a study that really got my attention about the vegetarian diet. The, 
a low protein vegetarian diet and how it can affect people's health. So this was a study where they followed women in the UK for 20 years and the vegetarian women had about a 33% increased risk of hip fracture. The, the point I wanna make here is that too many of the vegetarian diets are too low in protein. You can, the vegetarian diet is a very healthy diet. It has lots of colorful vegetables and healthy oils and fruits and all of these things, but it's often too low in protein. Now you can, you can have a very thoughtful, if you're careful, vegetarian diet with enough protein, but you need to be careful about that because of muscle loss and bone loss. And just real quick on why that might be. Well, we know that there's a lot of calcium in bones, but it turns out that, that it, about 50% of the bone structure is really this matrix of collagen protein. And without that matrix, the calcium isn't very strong. And all of us have had that example when we picked up a piece of chalk and we just put a little bit of stress on it and it broke. So calcium itself, though it's hard, it doesn't have a lot of strength some compressive strength, but doesn't have the rigidity and the, the lateral ability to resist fracture. And, and that's why the protein is so important in bones. I have just one slide on fermented foods. What we're finding is that so many of these fermented foods that are delicious from sourdough bread to kombucha to cottage cheese or sauerkraut or cheese or yogurt or kefir, kimchi, that that these are not only delicious, but they're amazing for human health. They're great for the bowels, the brains, the bone, uh, uh, so many things. Um, you wanna try to have some every day and it actually decreases inflammation in the human body. It's miracle grow for a healthy microbiome, the gut. And when the gut's healthy with, with a um, diverse, um, vibrant microbiome, the whole body is less inflamed. So the last slide on nutrition is keep it simple. Eat real food the, the best you can. Eat less processed foods and try not to eat too much. And, and that'll usually get, get you there. You don't have to be perfect. You can enjoy a vegetarian diet. You can enjoy a paleo diet, a Mediterranean diet, a vegan diet. All of those can be quite healthy for you, but you want to use eat whole foods. Uh, make sure you get enough protein and uh, avoid too many processed foods. Okay, I'm going to move into... Yes, there was a question. So when a person sends in a question, I'm going to just repeat it. And, and, and the question went something like this. You talk about collagen. How is it important? important? When does it make a di difference in different age groups uh, for structures like the bones and the cartilage? So collagen is a, is a particular protein. It's, it has only three amino acids in it. So it's not a full complete protein. So it's not going to help you build muscle, but it's particularly good at supporting the um, the other support structures in the body, like the bones, like the joints, like the skin um, and the tendon. So it's real important. And it used to be part of a common diet because human beings, when they, they ate animals, they ate from head to toe uh, with eating the animal and then making soups and broths and these sorts of things. And you would get plenty of collagen. So collagen is important. I think it's important throughout life, but maybe even more important as we get older, because that's when the issues with our joints, our cartilage, and our bones become more apparent. It's not uh, a complete protein, so don't add it into your protein intake. If you're 150 pounds, you need 100 grams a day of protein. Don't add the collagen in because it's not a complete protein, though it's good for those structures. I recommend about 10 to 20 grams daily for most people, 50 and older. So three things for exercise, move more, Turn up the intensity when you can, and you'll see the studies tell us that, and get stronger. Peter Atia is a physician, an author, and a podcaster some of you may be familiar with. And he said recently that exercise is, be, is by far the most, in, excuse me, by far the most potent longevity medicine. Wow. I thought nutrition was all about that. But exercise really has more oomph in this regard. No other intervention does nearly as much to prolong our life, to pre preserve our cognitive, our brain, and our physical function both. And unfortunately, most people aren't doing enough. It's a strong statement, but I think the literature that I'm gonna show you over the next few minutes will support that. This is Peter's book, Outlive. It was published 
just in the last few weeks, a terrific book. So it's thick with science. He's a, he is a, um, he's good at explaining it and, and why he thinks um, what he thinks and based on the literature and he's, he's uh, good to learn from. So I showed you this study, but I'm just going to reiterate this is one of the first things that, that we, we talked about. And this, oh, no, no, I didn't. This was, this is not the one I was thinking. This is a different one. This um, looks at the association of leisure time physical activities and the risk of several things, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, and cancer mortality in older adults. And this is in the Journal of the American Medical Association, August last year. And what they said here is even a low level of physical activity. We can measure how hard you're exercising by something called a MET, M-E-T, and 7.5 to 15 METs a week. And I'll discuss what that means. And they followed almost 300,000 people for 12 years. Their average age was 70. And they found that many different activities from walking to running to swimming to racket sports showed a significant reduction in all cause, cause mortality, dying from any reason prematurely and the fitter the better. But what they said is that even if you just walked for an hour twice a week, that's about eight mets. So you would have met that criteria of 7.5 to 15 mets. And by doing that alone, you can reduce your risk of premature mortality by up to 16%. So the studies are gonna tell us the fitter the better, but even a low level of activity can be helpful, very helpful. And that all sorts of different activities. And you can see them on the side. It could be some weightlifting. It could be golf, swimming, kayaking, riding a bike, all of these things. So find something you like to do and, and uh, enjoy it and get try to get moving. Uh, and most days, I would say more than two days a week is best. This is the study that, I, that we talked about out of the gate. And this was with all of those veterans, 750,000 of them. And here they said that even with a moderate amount of physical um, fitness as measured by a treadmill test, and even a moderate amount, you can reduce uh, premature mortality by greater than 50%. And, and this said, they said that this was easily achievable by the current recommendations of being active for 150 minutes a week. They went on to say the fitter the veterans were, the better they did. Uh, and this was more important than any other cardiac risk factor. Again, this was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. So this has some, um, some credibility behind it. Plus it's a huge study, 750,000 people. This looks at the, uh, the daily step count in both cancer mortality and cardiovascular health and all cause mortality. And here they said that adding an additional 2000 steps a day decreases the risk of those concerns by eight to 11% all the way up to 10,000 steps daily. And we're gonna see that 10,000 number again. So if you're walking 3,000 steps and you add another couple thousand steps, you will significantly improve your health going forward and reduce your risk of serious conditions. And that's really doable because um, a person can get about um, 100 steps a minute. So if you walk for 10 minutes, you can get about 1,000 steps. And if you walk for an additional 20 minutes, so a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the afternoon, there's your 2,000 steps and you're improving your health. If you're walking up to 10,000 steps a day, the risk reduction was 36%. And again, here they said in this study, as we're gonna see in almost every study we look at in exercise, when you do it uh, with higher intensity, you even get more benefits. So if you're out for a walk and you have the opportunity to walk a hill once in a while, as a part of your walking program, that's a great way to turn up the intensity. But what about if you have knee pain? This was a wonderful study that was published in the Journal of Rheumatology and Arthritis. And they showed that, that adults in their 50s with knee pain, if you put them on a walking program, they did better, they had less pain. And there was even some evidence that their joint spaces were better after that year. So they said these findings support that a walking program should be encouraged for adults with arthritis of the knee. Wow. That doesn't mean that if you have arthritis that you should go out and walk five miles tomorrow, but it does mean you want to start, start slow, see what your body can tolerate and, and keep it up throughout the year. This is the, the strength training. And this is the one that showed us that 30 to 60 minutes of strength training. So there'd be one or two sessions 
can lower the risk of, of cancer mortality, heart disease, and early mortality by 10 to 17 percent. And then if you combine some strength training, even with aerobic training, that you have the steepest reduction. Strength training is important. It, it helps when you stress the muscles, the muscles, re, they, uh, they secrete from their tissue, the muscle tissue, these myokines. And these are small molecules that, that, that course through your bloodstream. They stimulate the body, the brain, the tissues, the blood vessels to get stronger, to become more resilient. To, to heal, this um, is a terrific, it's terrific medicine is what it is. This looked at the daily step count in dementia. And here they looked at 78,000 people followed for many years and they had risk, risk accelerometers. So they, they knew how much these people were walking. Again, it's not just a survey or a question. And they found that as it, that the optimal amount of exercise was about 10,000 steps, 9,800 steps. And, and the folks that had the higher step, step count over time had a lower risk of dementia. And again, intensity of stepping, they said this was a, an English study, the intensity of stepping resulted in stronger benefits. So walking can be fine though. Again, lots of different ex exercises are great. One of my favorite exercises is trekking on the trails around Jefferson City. Uh, I love Frog Hollow Trail right across the street here and I use my walking poles. And the reason I do is because I can walk faster actually and I can zip through those trails and I love that, but I'm also using a lot more of my muscles. And you can see that the, the man on the right using those walking poles is engaging the, the, the major muscles of the back, the abdomen, the upper extremities, lots more benefit. The other thing I find is when I'm when the trails are wet or a little bit slick that I can more safely trek through there at a at a, at a brisk rate um, when I have those more confidently. So I I love my walking poles and I love trekking. So this looked at exercise and cognition in midlife. So this was not about dementia. This just said that in midlife, if you were an exerciser, did you have a quicker, smarter brain? than if you weren't an exerciser. This looked at a cohort of British citizens that were born in 1970, about 4,400 of these. And they did um, an assessment at their age of 46, how much the activity they had, they used an accelerometer again, so they could really measure objectively. And then they put them through cognitive testing. Moderate to vi vigorous exercise appeared to be most beneficial and it increased the, um, the cognitive scores, that is, the more active they were, the higher their cognition was, even in midlife. This is another reason to stay fit. And this study is an older study, but it has so much power to it that I wanted to bring it up. Women are 67%, or about two out of every three people who get Alzheimer's disease are women. 40% of women will have a dementia of some sort by the age of 85. So this is a big deal in women's health. And this amazing study that was done in Sweden followed 1,462 women. It started in 1968, ended in 2012. And what they did when these women were 50 years of age, they put them on a bicycle, an ergometer, so they could tell how much power, how much speed, what kind of fitness they had. And the women that were most fit at age 50 had an 88% decreased risk of dementia. This is, so for those of you that friends or family yourself uh, are in that midlife, this is a great time to be fit. If you're past that, or it's harder to be that fit for lots of reasons, demands in your life, any sort of fitness as we're seeing, just walking another 2000 steps, walking vigorously up a hill, the, doing some weight training, all of these have benefit, right? But it's in, impressive both in this study and the VA study, where they really objectively saw how fit people were and those people did the very best. That's why we can say that this is one of the most powerful medicines. This is about uh, getting your heart rate up and that's you know briskly walking up steps, going for a brisk swim, an exercise bike ride or a regular bike ride. This is aerobic training and it's certainly important. This is a little bit about strength training. When we, uh, most people get the idea that you, you strengthen your muscles when you're 
pulling things towards you and you're shortening your, your muscle. Like if you're pulling that weight up and you're uh, doing a bicep curl, it turns out that it's actually the lowering of the muscle, the, the weight back down slowly is where the muscle gets the most input to get stronger and to build. So both are important, the, the concentric or shortening of the muscle, but the slow eccentric, the, the lengthening the muscle under tension is where the, the muscle really responds. So some keys to strength training is that muscle is, the, is a key for, for the function of our brain. Our heart lowers the risk of cancer, helps us reduce the risk of diabetes, and it certainly helps everyday function, which is so important. Strength training works for both sexes, men and women, and of all ages. There's really neat studies of women in their 80s doing power lifting, you know, lifting deadlifts of, you know, it's not hundreds of pounds, but it's they're lifting heavy things off the ground. And, and those women are getting stronger uh, and they're having better, stronger bones. Three days a week would be op optimal, but even one day a week makes a difference. If you do a, an exercise program, one day a week for the next 52 weeks, you're gonna be stronger. There's no doubt about it. 52 sessions will definitely make a difference. So one day a week is fine. You wanna start slow because you can certainly get injured. Um, but if you do start slow, the body responds and then you can progressively add weight. A typical way to do this would be six to 12 repetitions. That's when we build the most strength and the most muscle growth, typically about three sets slow with good form. And when your form starts to break, you get wonky and out of position, then you just stop. Um, you wanna maintain good form and posture when you do your exercises. And as I mentioned, you wanna emphasize the, the slow elongation of the muscle, the eccentric part of the exercise. And when you do exercises, you can do them in, you, know, you basically wanna push and pull in the, uh, when you're using your upper body, push and pull in three directions push and pull overhead, push and pull in front of you, and push and pull down below. Uh, so this might be you know, a push up or a bench press. This may be an overhead press. I'll give you some examples of this as we go forward here. And when you do this strength training, you, may, you wanna make sure, particularly if you wanna grow muscle, that you're getting more protein. So these fun movements, functional movements, are I think some of the most important things you can do. I love the squat, just the squat like that man's doing. That's that ability to use, they have your knees in the right position over your feet to really use those powerful muscles in your rear. The, the glute, that's called the hip hinge function or the using the glute muscles, very, very important. The, another really neat exercise is what the, he's doing below that. That's called the split squat. And it's okay to use a chair for balance. You're, you're just standing there, you bring your knee down and you come back up. You try to keep your knee straight in front of you, the one in front. Don't let it tilt into the uh, towards the center, out to the side, maintain good function. That is a very important exercise. Then above on the right is the bridge. Really strengthen your hip muscles, the, your glutes and the stabilizers, your abdomen and lower back. That's a terrific exercise for your lower body. And I like push-ups too, and push-ups can be modified like that, that position there. One of the ways I like to modify push-ups is to do them on a counter to start with. So you find a good solid counter, then you would be on an angle. So the, it doesn't, you're not gonna be lifting your whole body weight. That's a great way to do it. And this would be with some bands. And on the top is that, so you're pushing up, right? And below that, you're pulling down. So that's an overhead type activity. You're pushing up or pulling down. Now down below, they're, they're doing some curls where they're pulling up. You can also do tricep work where you're straightening the elbow and that would be a, a pushing down. Um, and you could, all, you, know, you could also do those front and where you had the band behind you and you were pushing out like a, which would be kind of a push up position. That might be another way to use that. So those basic exercises, those particularly the ones on the left for your, for your lower body, and some of those push-pull exercises for your upper body makes a big difference. You want to have good posture, your, your chin up, your, your head tall, um, your abdomen in, your shoulders back. Those are good, maintain good posture. And this, this is another way to keep yourself healthy. Things like Tai Chi and yoga, great for balance. You know, it's known that many adults lose some of their bone mineral density and are risk for fractures, but people who are can balance like those women and that man in the back there, 
they don't fall as much and they're much less likely to fracture. So a summary for exercise, get your steps. It's a great idea to have a step counter. Get as many as you can comfortably. Add an extra 10 or 20 minutes of steps daily if possible, but um, do it brisk if, as possible. And then any other exercise you'd like from racket sports to gardening to, uh, to trekking like I like or swimming or riding a bike, all of those are great. And then get stronger. Love those exercises we just went over and find ways to get your heart rate up as brisk is better. A few things on the dietary supplements, the last few slides here. This was a real important study that was done through the National Institutes of Health where they looked at 2,200 adults and they simply gave them a multivitamin. And they followed one group that got the multivitamin for three years and the other group that did not. And the group that got the multivitamin had significant slowing of age-related cognitive decline by 60%. Um, so multivitamins, a simple one, are safe and it can have a difference. And this is an important study in a, at a, an important institution, the National Institutes of Health. This is the study I showed earlier that the combination of vitamin D, omega-3 oil, and exercise significantly reduces the risk of cancer by 61%. All of those alone had some benefit, but when they were put together, some exercise, a simple home exercise, program, an omega-3 oil capsule, 1,000 milligrams a day, and vitamin D, that those three made a significant difference in, in the likelihood of developing cancer over the next several years. And this last vitamin one, this is about autoimmune disease. And autoimmune diseases are things like thyroid, thyroiditis, or rheumatoid arthritis, or lupus, um, inflammatory bowel conditions like Crohn's or I, IBD. Um, these are common in the US and they're, they're increasing over the last 40 years. And it shows here that the combination of vitamin D and omega-3 significantly reduced the risk of, of having this occur in your life by 30%. These are uh, safe and low risk interventions. They're not terribly expensive, thankfully, and they lowered many significant autoimmune conditions. Like I mentioned, rheumatoid arthritis, polymyalgia, rheumatica, thyroid disease, psoriasis, and others. So these are my basic supplement recommendations, a low dose of vitamin D, a multivitamin, and omega-3. For people that are prone to skin cancer, niacinamide has been shown to decrease the risk of that by about 25%. And then I think it's a good idea to have your vitamin levels checked, B12, folate, homocysteine, vitamin D, omega-3. And that's it. I thank you so much uh, for attending. Uh, if there's any other questions, we'll be glad to take the next few minutes to answer them. And the thing I'd like to say is that the research tells us without a doubt over the last couple of years that nutrition and exercise significantly improve our health uh, and reduce our risk for chronic serious conditions like heart disease and cancer and dementia. And it's, it's really worth doing what you can. You don't have to be perfect with your diet, eat more he whole healthy foods, stay away from some of the processed foods and find a way to get moving, whatever your body will allow even if it's an extra 1,000 or 2,000 steps a day, all of those things can be beneficial. So there is a few questions, and the first one was about osteoporosis. If a person has developed osteoporosis, should they increase their dairy to a certain extent? And the the answer is, is that dairy plays a small role in bone health. Um, major studies from Scandinavia where they, they have some of the highest dietary uh, dairy intake, they actually have some of the highest incidence or the highest likelihood of osteoporosis. So dairy doesn't necessarily improve osteoporosis. Dairy is a good whole food. It does have calcium, but calcium is not the biggest key for bones. It's really protein and exercise. Um, calcium plays a plays a part, but it's not a uh, it's not as uh, strong of a lever to improve bone health. So low dose of calcium of uh, uh, additional calcium is not an unreasonable thing to take in your in your life. You want to get about a thousand milligrams in your diet. If you want to get that from dairy, uh, that's not so hard to do. Eight ounces of milk is about three hundred milligrams of calcium. You know, a cup of yogurt would have about the same. 
uh, you don't need to take large amounts of calcium supplements because that can abnormally calcify some of your other tissues like your tendons and your arteries. So most of the calcium can be obtained through your diet. Some of that certainly can be obtained through dairy and that's a fine way to do it if you like. Relating to nutrition, you mentioned. Another not question here. Not too much. What do you mean by not too much to avoid overeating? Stephanie's going to repeat that one for me one more time. So you mentioned that you wanted someone to, to not overeat. What did you mean by that? So what, what sort of... I mentioned some of the caveats about good nutrition, eating whole food, avoiding processed foods and not eating too much. And and the question was, what does that really mean, not eating too much? Well, that's a hard one. Um, it, it depends on if you if your body weight is in the normal range, if you're low in body weight and then you're going to want to have some excess calories, or if your body weight is excessive and you're for your good health and say your body mass index is over uh, 30 would be a place where I would start to get concerned and you might have other concerns like diabetes or blood pressure issues or uh, issues with cholesterol and heart disease. Then it means less and it, uh, to know exactly what a person needs, it's, uh, it, that would uh, be best to talk to your healthcare provider, talk to a nutritionist. But many people, if they're trying to lose weight and they're an average, you know, they're an average adult, they often need to get their calories down to about 1,200 calories a day for a period of time to lose weight. Sometimes a little less, sometimes a little bit more, depending on their metabolic rate. But that's something that's very specific to the individual. So that's a hard question to answer. Question was about vitamin D and K2 and whether that should be taken together. Those are those do go together well, like Tom and Jerry. Uh, the vitamin D is important for so many things, our immune system, our bone health, uh, being able to get calcium to the right places in the body. Same thing for vitamin K. Vitamin K is kind of the traffic cop for calcium in the body, and it it tells the body to place it in the bones, not in places like our arteries. It, they are best to be taken together in modest amounts. It's a good idea to have your, if you're taking vitamin D, to get your vitamin D checked. And if you're taking vitamin K, the best dose for that is something in the range of 180 micrograms daily, 180 micrograms daily for vitamin K in a person that's trying to improve either their blood vessel health or their bone health. So if you're gonna start an exercise program, is it better to start with a more complex one where, where you might have some walking and aerobic exercise and strength training at the same time or start with one at a time. I think it's fine to just start. I, and I, I think walking is the place to start. Find a time where you can routinely work. I really love walking in the morning. Uh, in the summer when it's gonna be cooler, the sun is out, it helps with so many things if that fits into your life. But for me, you know, I often have a break here at the clinic from 10 to 10, 15. And that's one of the times that I go for a walk in each day. Um, but then shortly thereafter, I think a strength training program is great. And there's lots of opportunities uh, to do this both at home or to get yourself a trainer through places like Capital Regions HealthFlex or the YMCA or other trainers in town. And I often do recommend that because I think that learning how to do it properly with good form in a way that you can progress with, with maybe some aches and pains because you're using the muscles, but without injuries is what you want to do. So I, I do recommend trainers. What about honey? Do you recommend honey? The question was, do I recommend honey? So I think honey can be a part of a healthy whole food diet. And it um, it is a high glycemic food. It has lots of glucose and fructose in it. It's really no different. You know, a teaspoon of honey is really no different than a teaspoon of sugar in regards to the metabolic effects of it. It's going to raise your blood sugar. It'll sweeten things up. If you don't have too much, it's okay. It does have some other uh, interesting nutrients that come from the local environment. So it may have some benefits, but from a metabolic standpoint, it's really no different than table sugar. Looks like there may be a couple more questions. I, I think that's all.
Well, that was all. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, I'm so glad you could join us. I hope you could take some things home um, that you can uh, add to the quality of your life, the, your, your, the, the, the vigor and uh, health and happiness in your life. We will have this recorded and send it out to you. I'm so glad you could join us. We'll look forward to doing another one of these talks in the fall and we'll go from there. Have a wonderful summer. <laughs>